Hello everyone, this is Bhavik Choksi over here and I hope you guys are doing great. In today's video, we would be doing index 36 in an exhaustive manner in the most optimum possible time for your revision. Again, this is a revision video covering all concepts. However, we would not be doing sums over here. This is for your concept revision. So, let us get started. Index 36 covers impairment of assets and is one of the important standards in your CA final FR syllabus. Now, the question would arise, why would we need a separate standard for impairment and to which assets is it applicable? First, this is applicable to items like PPE, intangibles, investment property and goodwill, largely. Because for other assets like inventories, financial assets at FEDPL, FE, OCI, etc., the impairment provisions are already there in the respective standards. Like you compare inventory at the lower of cost or NRV or financial assets at fair value. In which case, for certain items like PP, intangibles, investment property, etc., we don't have a provision to test for a reduction in the value if there is a reduction in these assets. And hence, there's a separate standard in DES 36. Now, how do you check for impairment? Well, you compare carrying value, that is the ledger balance, that is the assets cost usually, less the accumulated depreciation or amortization. You compare the carrying value with a number called as recoverable value. Now, how do you calculate recoverable value? Well, recoverable value is the higher of the fair value less cost to sell. That is the price that I were to get if I were to sell the asset today or the value in use. Value in use is the present value of future cash flows. We will select higher of the two as a recoverable value. Now, this provision is different from what you study in inventory or financial assets because these are assets which you usually hold for the purpose of selling. However, assets like PP can be sold or they can be used and hence the value that you can recover from the asset is either the fair value less cost to sell if I decide to sell the asset or the present value of future cash flows that I will get if I decide to use the asset and hence as a businessman I will select whichever is the best for me and hence the higher of the two. For, for this we need to kind of go into slight detailing on what is value in use, how do you calculate it but before that let us assume the carrying value of the asset for example is 100 and the recoverable value comes to let us say 80. Let us say the fair value less cost to sell is for example 70 and the value in use is 80 and hence there is an impairment of 20 rupees. Impairment is a one sided standard it will be recorded if there is a reduction in the carrying value. However, if the recoverable value for example comes to 180 well there is no impairment because the asset is capable of giving you more than what you have recorded in the books it is not impaired in fact it is a good asset. So, sir, should you increase the value? Well, that is dependent on whether you are following revaluation model or not. However, under index 36, you are not supposed to increase the value. Uh, if there is a reduction, you are supposed to reduce it. Okay. So, if there is a reduction, that is an impairment of, for example, 20 rupees, from where will this 20 rupees be taken? Well, this 20 rupees will be taken usually into the profit and loss account provided the asset was recorded using the cost model. However, if the asset was recorded using the revaluation model, then it is possible that there is a revaluation reserve existing against this asset. So, let us say it is possible that the revaluation surplus has a balance of 15 rupees. Then, you will first adjust the 20 rupees of impairment against revaluation and excess, if any, will go against the profit and loss account. If there is no revaluation reserve, then there is no problem. You will directly take it against the profit and loss account. Now, when should you do this? Well, uh, like inventory, you compare the carrying value with the NRV at each balance sheet date. Should you also do this for fixed assets, intangibles, etc. at each balance sheet date? Well, the answer is no. Uh, impairment is to be done only and only or impairment testing, that is estimation of recoverable value is to be done only if the indicators exist. Why? Well, because estimating the recoverable value is a time consuming as well as expensive process and hence you don't want to burden the companies by doing it each year. Estimation of NRV is simple because you are selling inventory in the ordinary course of business daily, not fixed assets and hence estimating fair value or value in use is a time consuming as well as expensive process. You do this if and only if the indicators exist. What are the examples of indicators? Well, there can be external indicators like for example, adverse technological changes like what happened in Kodak, which was a photographic company and uh, digital cameras came in is an indicator of impairment 
or if there is entry of a strong competitor like for example when jio entered a lot of telecom companies probably could not earn as much revenue so that is a potential indicator of impairment or maybe uh, if uh, there is let us say an adverse legal change so if you are a cigarette company or if you are an alcohol company and let us say in a few states the cigarettes or alcohol gets banned then that is an indicator of impairment there i mean these are just illustrative indicators one of the indicators is also that the market cap of the company is lower than the book value then probably that is because the value of the assets in the books is higher these are all the external indicators of impairment and these are just illustrative also there can be certain internal indicators like you are making continued cash losses or the asset has suffered physical damage like there is a flood and the asset has suffered physical damage these are also indicators of impairment in which case you will do impairment testing that is you will try to check for recoverable value in other cases you don't even need to do impairment testing and this is subjected to management discretion now impairment testing is to be done only when the indicators exist in general however for specific assets index 36 mentions that impairment testing has to be done on an annual basis these are intangible assets under development intangible assets having an indefinite life and goodwill arising out of business combination the common thread that ties all these three assets is that these are intangibles and they are not amortized each of these assets are not subjected to amortization and hence the standard believes that well if you don't test them for impairment regularly or annually then it is possible that these assets will continue to remain at the same value for a very long period of time they are intangibles and hence the standard wants you to test it for impairment annually so these are the three assets which are subjected to annual impairment testing okay uh, impairment remember is something which can get the asset at best to zero so if the asset is fully impaired any expense or cost beyond that will not be covered under index 36. second if impairment is recorded and at a later stage is it possible that the impairment can be reversed well the standard says why not a reversal of impairment is possible so for example you have impaired the asset because there was a legal ban and a few years later the ban gets lifted in which case there is an indicator of an improvement in the service potential of the asset there is a possibility that the asset is now capable of generating a higher value in use or higher net selling price and as a result over here uh, it is possible that there is a reversal of impairment can you reverse impairment the answer is yes up to what value can you reverse impairment well after impairment the asset cannot go beyond the carrying value had there been no impairment loss or recoverable value whichever is lower so this is the ceiling this is a threshold beyond which the asset cannot go so this is about reversal of impairment remember goodwill once impaired cannot be reversed because if you reverse it later that can potentially point out to creation of a self-generated goodwill and hence goodwill impairment cannot be reversed and for other assets impairment can be reversed provided there's an improvement in service potential that is there is a expected increase in the fair value or uh, 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 fair value less cost to sell or there's an increase in value in use in other cases merely because of present value of time value adjustments you will not show a reversal of impairment it will only be done if there's an improvement in service potential now before you proceed further into the standard we would want to understand at length what is meant by value in use and institute has given you clear guidance on what do you mean by value in use well value in use refers to the present value of future cash flows that are expected to be generated by using the asset like for example if i'm a company who has bought a car and i'm planning to use the car for the purpose of earning cab rentals then the value in use will be calculated as the present value of the future cash flows that i generate from using the car that is maybe the rental income that i get uh, in the form of cab fares minus all the expenses that i have to incur to generate that income in the regular course like for example uh, uh, driver salary fuel expenses uh, or maintenance of the car all of these will be deducted after that whatever cash flows that you get like you do in a capital budgeting is the cash inflow that should be considered in this cash inflow calculation regular expenses like maintenance should be considered also items like salvage that you will get at the end of the useful life should also be considered it is a regular assessment like you do for capital budgeting in case of an asset present value of all of these cash flows now there are a few items which the institute wants you to consider wants you to ignore which are these items first is interest should you calculate the cash inflows before tax uh, before interest or after interest the standard says you have to calculate it before deducting interest this is the cash flows that you are generating from the asset now interest is financing in nature not operating in nature like you might buy a house or you might buy a car 
partly from own funds, partly from debt funds or entirely from own funds or entirely from debt funds. You want to see whether the house or the car as the case may be impaired. For that, regular expenses of the house or the car like driver salary, fuel expenses, all of these should be considered. However, if you are finance using equity, you don't have to pay interest. If you are finance using debt, you have to pay interest. That does not make the house inferior or the car inferior. It is a financing activity. And as a result, the standard says you want to see the operating capability of the asset irrespective of whether it is finance using debt money or equity money. And hence, you find the cash inflows before deducting interest. But an apple to apple comparison should tell you that if your cash inflows are before deducting interest, then the relevant discount factor should be the, the uh, cost of capital comprising debt and equity both. Because you are trying to find the cash inflows for both debt that because it is uh, before deducting interest as well as equity and hence the relevant discounting factor ideally should be similar to the WSAC. It is a discount factor based on the risk of the asset which is based on the WSAC, the weighted average cost of capital. So before interest and the discounting factor is WSAC. Second, taxes. Ideally in a regular capital budgeting question, we will always deduct tax. We should generally deduct tax. However, in the value in use workings, tax is not to be deducted. Sir, what is the reason? Well, probably it is because you are again trying to test for efficiency of the asset. Merely because there is one company whose assets are located in a special economic zone, let's say SEZ, and hence the company is not paying tax. There is another company who has a similar asset, who is located outside of the special economic zone, and hence on that similar income, the company is paying tax. Now, that does not make the first company's assets more superior than the second company's. Or one of them is a loss-making company and hence not paying tax. The other one is a profit-making company and hence paying tax. Well, that's correct at an overall company level. But at an individual asset level, uh, the asset does not become more or less uh, 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 efficient because of tax. And hence the standard says that you should do the cash inflow calculation before deducting tax. A corresponding adjustment over here should also be that the WSAC that you typically calculate is after tax WSAC like when you calculate cost of debt, you take interest into 1 minus T. Now because the cash inflows are before tax, the WSAC should also be pre-tax. That is when you calculate the cost of debt for the WSAC calculation, you will not do the 1 minus T adjustment. So it has to be before interest, before tax and your relevant discounting factor should be the pre-tax WSAC. Next, if you are expecting future technological changes or you are expecting uh, 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 future restructuring, the standard says you should not consider them in the value in use calculation till the time you are committed to the restructuring or committed to the technological changes. Hypothetically and overly simplifying this, let us say I have a car and on an overly simplistic basis, I want to implement a technology inside the car which makes it driverless. Now, let us say such a technology is not there. As a matter of fact, today we are having some cars, but let us hypothetically such a technology is not there. So, we say that, okay, there will be a time when there will be driverless cars and I will remove the driver and hence my asset will be more efficient. Well, till the time such a technology is developed and you buy such a technology and implement it, you cannot consider your cash inflows without considering driver salary. You have to consider driver salary. So, future potential technological improvements or restructurings have to be ignored till the time you are actually committed to such restructurings or technological changes. Should inflation be considered? Of course. So, over here, regular inflation will be considered in uh, the estimation of revenues as well as the estimation of expenses. And in case of certain special cases like site restoration, when you want to check for a potential impairment, you have to ensure that you compare the carrying value with the appropriate recoverable value. So, if your carrying value of the asset is a ledger balance in your ledger, you have a debit balance for the asset and a credit balance separately for provision for site restoration. When I compare it with the recoverable value, for example, the net selling price, the buyer pays you money for the asset when the buyer takes over the asset along with the site restoration obligation and hence usually the recoverable value that is the fair value less cost to sell or the present value of future cash flows that is the value in use is calculated after considering the site restoration. But in your books, the asset is at 1000 and separately there is a credit balance let us say of 500 for site restoration. So, what the buyer is paying you probably 700, the buyer is paying you for the asset as well as the liability and hence if you want to compare and check for impairment, you should compare the carrying value of both the asset and liability combined that is 1000 minus 500, that is 500 with the, value in, uh, with the value in use or the net selling price which should also be after 
considering site restoration. Alternatively, you can ignore site restoration in which case the value in use as well as the net selling price should also be before the site restoration and the carrying value will be after uh, carrying value will also be before deducting the site restoration credit balance. So, it has to be an apple to apple comparison either comparing the carrying value after site restoration with the recoverable value after site restoration or taking it before site restoration. So, these are the important points. There is one more point I think on foreign exchange where the standard says that in case you have a foreign asset, then you will try to convert uh, uh, the dollar cash inflows. You will try to discount the dollar cash inflows at the foreign currency discount rate, find the present value of those dollars and convert the present value into rupees at the prevailing spot rate. So, that will give you uh, the value in use in rupees which can be used to be compared with the carrying value of the asset which should be in rupees as well. So, that takes care of value in use workings. This section till now is the first part of the standard which involves a single asset impairment. Now, the second part of the standard looks at group of assets. Now, the first part of the standard usually assumes that the assets that you are checking for impairment are capable of generating a largely independent cash flow. Like a car for example can generate a largely independent cash flow. However, if you have a group of assets which are a part of an assembly line, for example, on an overly simplistic basis, let us say there are four assets which work together to manufacture a bottle of Pepsi. There is one, one uh, let us say, uh, machine which makes a concentrate, one machine, let us say, which makes the bottles, one machine which makes the caps and one machine which kind of assembles all of them. Now, each of this machine is integral, is necessary to generate the cash flow from selling a bottle of Pepsi. However, on its own, if let us say there is an indicator of impairment in machine C, which is making the caps, you cannot find the value in use for machine C because on its own it is not capable of generating a largely independent cash flow and hence the single asset impairment testing model might not work so efficiently because I cannot compare the carrying value with an appropriate recoverable value. In such cases, where you are unable to determine the recoverable value of an individual asset. In such cases, you will try to find the impairment at cash generating unit or a CGU level. What do you mean by CGU? CGU is the smallest group. It is the smallest group of, of identifiable assets which are capable of generating a largely independent cash flows. Now, there might be a group of assets, a huge group of assets. However, you do not look at the entire group of assets. You will look at the smallest group of assets which are capable of generating a largely independent cash flow. Like you can add a few machines which can make diet Pepsi or maybe flavored Pepsi. We will say that, okay, if there is an indicator of impairment in machine C, the smallest group of uh, asset which is capable of manufacturing Pepsi and generating an independent cash flow is these four machines together. So, a cash generating unit will come into the picture only if the individual asset where there is an indicator of impairment is not capable of generating a largely independent cash flow. In which case, rather than calculating a wrong impairment or an in uh, appropriate impairment, you compare the carrying value of the entire cash generating unit with the recoverable value of the cash generating unit that is all the machines together. Now, how do you calculate uh, uh, the carrying value of the cash generating unit. Well, there are four steps for doing impairment. First is calculating the carrying value. Carrying value is calculated as the carrying value of the individual assets in the cash generating unit like A, B, C, D. If there are four assets in the cash generating unit, then four assets put together. However, that may not be the only assets. These are assets which are manufacturing the bottle of Pepsi or let us say a packet of Maggi or a bottle of Thumbs Up. However, there may be other assets which are also contributing, not directly though. For example, there may be allocable corporate assets. Like if you are having Maggi uh, and four machines are coming together and manufacturing a packet of Maggi, maybe the Nestle, who is a manufacturer of Maggi, might have a research and development center located somewhere else who is trying to find new product mixes for Maggi. In which case, if Maggi is banned or if Maggi is impaired, yes, machine ABCD would be impaired, but the research and development center who is doing research for Maggi will also have a potential indicator of impairment. And as a result, the cash genetic unit is ABCD along with the corporate asset, like a research and development center, like uh, a training center or let us say like uh, 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 a head office. So, carrying value will also include the carrying value of allocable corporate assets. How do you allocate it? We will see. 
Also, it is possible that the cash generating unit may have allocatable goodwill attributable to the cash generating unit. Like, for example, Coca Cola once upon a time had acquired Thumbs Up and Gold Spot brands from Parley. Uh, now, when Coca Cola paid a amount to acquire these brands or these businesses, Coca Cola continued with Thumbs Up, it kind of closed gold spot and as a result there may be an indicator of impairment in gold spot in which case uh, the assets which are manufacturing gold spot a b c d are impaired the allocable corporate assets allocable to gold spot let us say is impaired but at the same time the goodwill that i'm at that is allocable to gold spot that i must have paid at the time of acquisition is also potentially impaired and as a result the carrying value which is to be compared with the recoverable value for the entire group of assets will be the carrying value of the identifiable assets plus the carrying value of the allocable assets plus the carrying value of goodwill if allocable that will give you the carrying value of the cgu which you will compare with the recoverable value for the entire cgu which is still the higher of the fair value less cost to sell or the value in use for the entire cgu that will give you the impairment impairment amount if any will be first allocable to goodwill why because goodwill is typically intangibles cannot be separately sold and it is linked to super profit here i'm not even able to earn my wsac let alone super profit i'm not even earning my normal profit and hence there's an impairment and hence the first allocation will go towards goodwill and excess if any will go towards the other assets including corporate assets in the ratio of their carrying values while doing this working you have to ensure that once you allocate the impairment loss to individual assets it is possible that a particular individual asset might have an individual value in use or individual fair value less cost to sell that is each individual asset that is a b c d or even the allocable corporate assets might have their individual recoverable value the allocation of the impairment loss has to be done in such a way that the carrying value of individual assets after allocating impairment cannot fall below their individual recoverable value like i can sell machinery a separately now there may be an impairment loss for the entire group i've allocated a part of loss to a but a can come out and say well you know what i'm able to recover what is there in my cost i will not bear the impairment in which case that corresponding impairment will have to be borne by the other assets to the extent possible Generally, it is possible to allocate the loss. However, in theoretical, hypothetical case, if the loss is in, in the loss is greater than what the assets are capable of bearing, then you will create a separate provision as per index 37. So, summarizing, first you calculate the carrying value of the CGU, which is the carrying value of the individual assets, plus the carrying value of the allocable corporate assets, plus the carrying value of the allocable goodwill. Compare that with the recoverable value of the CGU. Difference between the two, if positive that is if there's an impairment loss will be shown as impairment this impairment loss will first be allocated to goodwill and excess if any will be allocated to the other assets including the corporate assets in the ratio of their corresponding carrying values this allocation should be done in such a way that the carrying value of individual assets after the loss allocation cannot fall below their individual recoverable value now how will we allocate corporate assets typically corporate assets are allocated to the respective CGUs in the ratio of the carrying values of the CGU. This is the standard working. However, in certain cases, you might have a possibility where the corporate asset, for example, is worth 200 and has a life of 20 years. This corporate asset is used for three CGUs, A, B, and C, and each of these CGUs have a carrying value, let us say, of 100, 200, and 300, in which case the corporate asset should be allocated in the ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 3, ideally. However, these assets have different useful life, like CGU A has a 10-year life, CGU B has a 15-year life, CGU C has a 20-year life. So, one can say that, okay, CGU A is going, is a smaller CGU and hence will use a smaller portion of the corporate asset. However, CGU A has a smaller life as well. And as a result, if a life is also given, we need to consider both. Well, CGU A is a smaller CGU and it is also having a shorter life. And as a result, in such cases, the appropriate allocation ratio to find the allocable corporate asset will be the carrying value into the useful life. You will try to find the number which considers both of them and then allocate the corporate assets to each of the CGUs in the ratio of the adjusted carrying value, adjust that is the carrying value into the useful life. Okay. So, uh, uh, this is about uh, allocation and an example. Is it possible to reverse impairment loss in case of a CGU? Well, the answer is yes. The principles remain the same. You still cannot 
reverse an impairment on goodwill. For other assets, you can reverse in such a way that the value after the reversal cannot exceed the carrying value had there been no impairment or the recoverable value. Okay. We are then going to look at a situation where probably there are unallocable corporate assets. If there are unallocable corporate assets or unallocable goodwill, then the impairment testing happens at two levels. Level number one, where you will try to find the carrying value of the smaller cash generating units, compare that with the recoverable value of the smaller cash generating units and find impairment if there is any, even ignoring the unallocable corporate asset or unallocable goodwill. If there is an impairment, then you will first record it. Find the revised carrying values of these CGUs by applying the regular steps. And then we need to remember that these unallocable assets may not be allocable to departments. However, they may be allocable, they will be rather allocable to the company as a whole. And hence, you will do impairment testing for the company as a whole that is comprising of CGU A, CGU B, CGU C and also the unallocable corporate asset or the unallocable goodwill. You will try to find the carrying value of the entire company as a second step after doing impairment of the smaller CGUs, compare it with the recoverable value of the entire CGU and see if there is any impairment. If there is any impairment, the impairment will directly go to the unallocable corporate assets because the other assets are already at their carrying values or recoverable values, whichever is lower. They will not bear any further impairment. Impairment excess, if any, will go towards only the unallocable corporate assets and then going to the last part of the standard which has some connection with business combination as well as consolidation is goodwill impairment in case of a subsidiary in the consolidated financial statements once you do business combination you will see that there are two ways in which goodwill can be calculated one is a full goodwill method that is you will take the purchase consideration plus NCI that is non-controlling into set fair value less net assets 100% of them that will give you the goodwill. This will be the goodwill for the entire company 100% because NCI is also at fair value. Second method is doing the same steps that is PC plus the NCI using proportionate net assets method less net assets that will give you goodwill but this will be the goodwill only to the part of the stake that you have acquired. See if you have acquired 80% stake then that is partial goodwill attributable to 80% only. So, how will you do impairment testing in case of a subsidiary if there is an indicator of impairment, let us say on the subsidiary. The steps remain the same. You first try to find the carrying value of the entire CGU of the subsidiary, that is the carrying value of the individual assets of the subsidiary plus the allocable goodwill. Compare that ideally with the recoverable value, difference between the two is impairment. Now, the problem over here is when you look at subsidiary, all assets and all liabilities of the subsidiary are always 100% consolidated. So, if I have an 80% stake, I will still consolidate 100% of the assets, 100% of the liabilities, 20% of these assets, let's say, is attributable to non-controlling interest. In case of full goodwill, I will also consolidate 100% of goodwill, 20% of it is attributable to NCI. And hence, if there is an impairment loss, I will first allocate the impairment loss to goodwill, then to the other assets. A part of this loss has to be borne by the parent, a part of this loss has to be borne by the NCI. So the loss of goodwill will be borne by both the parent and NCI because this is full goodwill. It is attributable to both parent and NCI. The loss on other assets will also be borne by both parent and NCI because you are consolidating 100% of asset. 20% of this asset is attributable to NCI. So if these assets suffer a loss, NCI also suffers a loss. The problem arises in case of partial goodwill questions. In case of partial goodwill, the goodwill is attributable only to the parent. Other assets are all still attributable to parent and NCI. Further, when you want to determine the goodwill amount or the impairment amount, you will compare the carrying value and in the carrying value, you will take only the partial goodwill. Compare it with the recoverable value. However, for the recoverable value, you would have taken the present value of future cash flows, in which case you would have taken the entire business. And as a result, you are comparing recoverable value, which covers the benefits for the entire business 100%, including 100% of the goodwill with the carrying value, which covers, yes, the 100% of the carrying value of the assets, but only probably 80% of the goodwill. And hence, to overcome this situation and ensure an apple to apple comparison, an appendix to index 36 is added, which says that you will also Rec you will also create what you call as unrecognized goodwill. So the carrying value of the CGU in case of a partial goodwill question will be the carrying value of the individual assets plus the carrying value of the partial goodwill plus unrecognized goodwill. So if the goodwill is for example 80 for an 80% stake then you will also recognize 20 
for a, another 20% stake and hence that will give you the carrying value for the entire business that can appropriately be con compared with the recoverable value which is calculated as a present value of future cash flows for the entire business only. And hence you will get an impairment. Now this impairment is again allocated to goodwill and then to other assets. However, the part of the goodwill which is which is uh, uh, which is going to bear impairment loss is only the goodwill that appears in your books. So, for example, if you have a goodwill of 80 in your books and let us say the impairment loss comes as for example 100 because you have taken 80 plus 20 that is 100 for the purpose of carrying value calculation, you will allocate 80 percent of the loss that is 80 to the parent, 20 percent of the loss is attributable to the NCI. However, you can record the 20 loss only if you can impair the goodwill. Aapke books mein sif 80 ka goodwill hai. You cannot impair 100. And hence, well, if goodwill is not there for 20, you can't have an impairment loss of 20. So, the loss on goodwill in case of partial goodwill questions will always be borne by the parent only, only to the extent of the parent share. For the other assets, even if it is a partial goodwill question, the other assets are full 100% consolidated and hence the loss will be borne by parent and NCI both. This is a slightly tricky question for which we have a full-fledged, complete separate video. I would recommend uh, you can just refer the link of the video uh, uh, and I would recommend you can refer that video to get a better understanding. This kind of takes care of everything with an impairment. I hope this video has been helpful. If you think that this video helps, please do like, share and subscribe and uh, wish you all the very best. Let me know if you have any comments or feedback in the comment box. I'll be very happy to kind of address them uh, if possible. Good luck. Bye-bye. Take care.